Jesse Gould, welcome to the show, man. Thanks for having me. Great to be here. Where are you calling in from? Uh, New York. Uh, just moved here with my girlfriend in September. Like in the city? Yeah, Manhattan. Oh, nice, man. I, I grew up like about 45 minutes north of there. I was always in Manhattan as a kid, as a teenager. What do you think of it, man? I like it. Uh, I had lived here in the past. I went to college in upper state New York and then worked in banking uh, in the city before I joined uh, the army. And so oh, nice. I, always, I always liked it. You know, I, I feel like there's always a, a, a countdown when you get here. I don't think I could live here for past so many years, but you know, for, for short stints, it's, it's great. It's an awesome place. Um, and especially with, with the things I'm doing with this nonprofit, it's probably the best place to be in terms of connections and, you know, moving to the next level and things. Raising money, finding donors, things like that, trying to build awareness, that kind of stuff. That's what it's all about. The constant, yeah. the constant hustle. Yeah. How do, you probably live in a closet though, right? Well, uh, yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's, you have to, <laughs> it's, it's almost like you're considering whether you can buy another shirt, not because of the price of it, but whether you have the closet space for yeah. one more shirt. Yeah. I, I had a few friends who lived out there. I mean, they had the beds that they had to like pull down from the wall and everything like that. And like, you know, it's just, it, the space is so limited there, but I mean, you get some great things. I mean, there, there's literally something to do all the time. Uh, you got central park if you want to get out to a beautiful place and, uh, you know, um, there's always the train system. So if you wanted to get out to Connecticut or Jersey or something like that, you can get out there pretty easily. Yeah. I'm a big fan of places with good public transport. I grew up a lot of my life in Florida and it's mm -hmm. essentially, if you don't have a, a car or a bike, then you're just not going anywhere. You know, if I had a truck breakdown and I spent so much on Ubering to work every day, it was, it was pretty ridiculous. Yeah, I mean, I'm in California, so, and I grew, like I said, I'm an East Coaster at heart, but they don't have, I mean, they, they have trains out here, but they're nothing. Like, you can't get to LA in under three hours, and I'm, a, I'm like 60 miles away, you know what I mean? Yeah. It's ridiculous. Yeah, uh, LA's tough. So, for the people at home, um, if you can, just in a couple of minutes, uh, give them a little bit of background on who you are. You know, you served in the Army, you're a Ranger, Mortarman. Um, t tell us a little bit more about yourself. Yeah, of course. Uh, like I said, I uh, started off economics, financial background, uh, joined the military, uh, just always had that instinct within me. I knew I needed something to, uh, you know, sort of coming of age, finding the, the man inside myself. And so I joined the military, uh, became an army ranger. I was at 175th in, in Savannah, Georgia, a uh, couple or three combat deployments in Afghanistan, got out and had a similar issue to a lot of vets, uh, you know, had this sort of dark, looming dark cloud around me that I tried to ignore as best I can with as much beer as possible. But uh, as things settled down in my life, it became harder and harder and started appearing more and more in terms of depression, anxiety, just general unhappiness with my life and nothing I could do exercise, meditation, journaling got me past this point. And so I sought help through the VA um, and, you know, was essentially told that if I wasn't willing to go on medication, which I wasn't, that they couldn't do anything for me and they were already understaffed. And so they would pretty much apologize and left me to my own devices. Uh, so I came to the situation where I continued to ignore it, but I had this, this almost epiphany where it was like, hey, I'm living a pretty unhealthy lifestyle. I need to do something. Otherwise, I know I'm going to make some sort of major mistake or this is just not tenable. And ayahuasca is a, it's a psychedelic. It's a compound from two plants out of the Amazon becoming more and more popular. I heard about it, I had the initial instinct as a lot of people of like, hey, I, I'm not, a, I don't, I'm not a druggy. I don't do psychedelics. This is not my thing. But like I said, it, there's a point in my life where it was like a necessity. So I, I risked it. I, I left my job. I went to Peru and explored this and uh, just had a extremely pa profound, impactful uh, change on my life. And I saw all these amazing stories and it was just immediately clear that this is something that needs to be on more uh, veterans radar. 
And so that was the inspiration for me founding this uh, nonprofit called Heroic Hearts Project, which connects military veterans to ayahuasca and sometimes other psychedelic based therapies. Um, so, you know, providing the information out there, showing the, the scientific research that is available that is in support of this and why it works, not just, you know, tripping your ass off sort of thing, but an actual sort of clinical reason of why it works. And so we also provide this framework of preparation, coaching, um, integration afterwards to set people up for success, make sure they do it in the appropriate way, in a safe way. And then, you know, the second side of Heroic Hearts is the outreach is the, I wouldn't, I don't want to say marketing because it has connotations, but really that bringing these stories, these testimonials to people's front door and having them question why can't we even research these substances? Why are all these people in our program having to go to a different country to get this very powerful mental health uh, treatment that is saving a lot of their lives. There's been a lot of suicidal vets that have come to us that is a complete transformation of their life. Well, let, let's start with this because I mean, I've uh, I've done dimethyltryptamine, which uh, is the active ingredient uh, or one of the active ingredients in, in ayahuasca. I've, I've, I've had that experience before, and um, you know, we see a lot about psychedelics these days. And I, I want to talk about my own experience in a little bit. But, but how did you first hear of this? Because uh, I literally, I, I see it all over the place, just being in the community I'm in as a podcaster. Um, I used to work for Brian Rose of London Real. I, I worked with his organization for three years. Um, and and he, he's talked a lot about ayahuasca. How did you hear about it? Um, as, as you stated, it's just trickled more and more into common culture. You know, there'll be a few shows on a Netflix or you might hear a news report Oftentimes, it's leading in a lot of ways. I think one of the bigger factors was I was uh, getting into listening to a lot of Joe Rogan, uh, the podcast mm -hmm. for for a while. Yeah, uh, that he, movie, the uh, the Spirit Molecule, right? Yeah, I actually saw that after oh, a while after uh, my own experiences. But he constantly has guests and brought it up. And again, some uh, I think one of the major guests, like Abir Marcus, and at first for me it was kind of off putting because I was really talking more about the the visual side, which is not what I was after, you know, it wasn't about escape or this falsely profound thing that, okay, cool. I saw a dragon. None of that really appealed to me. Uh, but the more he brought it up in conversation, the more guests on his, his show uh, talked about it. I, and I did my own research and it almost planted the seed. And so, like I said, there's this necessity building in me where I knew I had to do something and I knew it had to be pretty big because all the other things I was trying just weren't working and uh, I just couldn't get past this barrier. And so I was just like, all right, well, my, I'm not happy with my life right now. So let's risk it. Let's, let's make this big change. This is completely out of my personality, but maybe that's exactly what I need. Yeah. Yeah. And one thing, I mean, Here's the, here's the big thing about it. A lot of people have this image of psychedelics, like, hey, you take some mushrooms, you go to a concert, or you take a hit of acid, you do this. Um, you know, in my experience, uh, something like ayahuasca or, or DMT or even a significant amount of mushrooms is not something that's fun, right? It's not, it's not a, a, uh, an experience you want to go to a party with, right? Right. Um, and, and so what was your first experience like? Yeah, I mean, it was similar. Uh, it, it's straight up kicked my ass. So the first few ceremonies, it was just all out war uh, with whatever it was, uh, whatever was going on in my head. And uh, But I think coming from the ranger background, that kind of made me respect it more. If it was this sort of light, you know, happy, typically like uh, kind of hippie sort of experience, I would have just been like, oh yeah, this is exactly what I thought it was. Did, but the did fact you that purge? I had, yeah, I purged a lot. Um, it, for me, it was a very physical uh, sort of thing, just because one, I didn't have experience with mind altering substances and I just have a, I tend to have a controlling brain. And so relinquishing control, which is an, assess, uh, an essential part of these experiences, allowing it to happen, allowing it to take hold. I was fighting it tooth and nail. And the more you fight it, the, the harder it gets. And so, you know, one of the first major learning processes with my interaction was it, with it was to just let go. 
um, and to allow myself not to have as much controlling uh, aspect. And I've actually seen the fact that I've I learned that during, you know, I learned it under fire, so to speak, uh, has, has had ripple effects in other aspects of my life. Um, so for instance, when things are going wrong, you want to have in your life, you try harder and harder to control it. And oftentimes that might make it go even more uh, into chaos. Uh, whereas if you just allow the way your life is flowing or the way things are going and understand um, and just kind of go in, in with it, steer into the, the skin, then oftentimes that's what it needs. And so just through my own controlling that was part of the anxiety buildup of this, this lack of being able to control uh, the way my life was going. And so it was almost like um, exercising this muscle in my brain that I had never even known was there. And so the moment I learned to do that through the ceremonies, it allowed me to do that in other aspects of my life. Yeah, there's this element of, of submission, right? Um, maybe people don't like that word. Uh, maybe it's more like, um, well, submission or surrender, probably people don't like that, but it is, I mean, kind of surrendering to, to what's going on and allowing yourself to realize that you're smaller than you really are. You are, are, are part of something. And that, that's kind of a lot of what I got out of my, my experience as well. Um, with this, so and again, I just want to get into the process because I'm sure there's a lot of people out there who are not very familiar with, with ayahuasca or psychedelics or, or some of the things going around them. So you actually went to Peru, right? And right. did you, did you do the, the dieta beforehand, uh, the whole nutrition process beforehand? So, so like, how did you find it? How did you book it? How did you prepare? Uh, so I didn't do, so, so with this process, um, what, what you're referring to is in terms of dieta and there's, there's different levels of that. So ayahuasca, especially the retreats, the way they're formatted nowadays, it's generally a week to two weeks. You'll go to these centers. Uh, it'll be generally in the jungle. Um, and you're just secluded in there with other people. And obviously the shaman that run the ceremonies and, they often, before you do this, they often recommend that you go on a certain diet, which is just pretty much eating healthier, cut certain things um, out of your life, alcohol, tobacco, mm -hmm. marijuana, all that kind of stuff that, you know, uh, distracts you or, or makes you less connected to your emotions, your, your feelings, all that kind of stuff. There's a more strict yet though for people who get more into it, where you actually have an even stricter diet of fish and, and rice, very basic kind of stuff. Um, and you, you concentrate on certain medicinal plants while you're there along with ayahuasca. So for my first go, it was really more of the, the, the subtler one, just watch what I eat beforehand, cut back on uh, alcohol, all that sort of stuff. Uh, I, did, I just did a lot of research. Um, I, I, I knew this was an important step in my life, and so I wanted to make sure that I did it uh, in a – appropriate way and wasn't putting myself at an unnecessary risk. Right. And I, I kind of had the same sort of notion of like, I have no idea what I'm doing. And, mm -hmm. and I didn't want to just like show up and see the first guy at an airport, which is what some people do and is not advisable. Uh, so I did a lot of research. I found centers. I found ones that had been doing it for a while uh, mm -hmm. with, you know, great testimony. And just from the website, you can kind of tell too of places that are just out to get your money. And it's kind of more of like a club med kind of thing versus ones that seem to have more respect for the process, the therapy, what you're going to get out of it. And so you get down to Peru and were there others there during this ceremony? Yeah. So the, the one I went to had about 15 other individuals. Mm -hmm. You generally do it in a group and just from, from their perspective to keep the lights on, uh, they, they generally do it in groups and there, there is a added element of, of group healing or, or going through this experience with others as well. And when you were going through it, so um, what was the environment like? You're, you're, are you in like a jungle house and is there music being played and things like that? Or is there like, yeah. So the one I, there's, they're popping, they're all over the spot, all over the place. And this is an Amazonian tradition. So there's a lot of different um, tribes that do it in their own unique way all throughout the Amazon, Brazil, Ecuador, Colombia. So I went to Peru. That's 
Peru and Iquitos is generally the spot that tends to be has grown to be sort of the hub of it or the reemergence of it. Um, and so there's a lot of centers there. Uh, and Iquitos is kind of a weird town. It used to be a industrial town during the rubber boom and kind of fell when rubber went out and is kind of reemerging as this weird tourist sort of spot. Um, but it's right on the Amazon River. So I went there, the retreat, uh, I selected, you take a bus, you go for a while, you take one of these little carts called tuk-tuks, uh, you hop on a boat, the boat then goes down the Amazon for another hour. So then by the time you get into the retreat, you're in the Amazon, you're pretty isolated. Uh, either trek through the woods if you dare or take a boat and those are pretty much your only exposure to, to society. And so, you know, it's, 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 and the, the centers are generally built in how you would expect it there. You know, it's, it's all wood, uh, very basic, pretty, you know, it's still comfortable, but pretty basic. You know, it's, your hut is there, it's closed off with like mosquito nets, very basic bed. Uh, the ceremonies ex themselves happen in these traditional huts called malokas, and they're, they tend to be sort of round, made of wood. Um, and when the actual experience happens, for the most part, they're at night, you go in there, um, the shaman who is, uh, it's, that's sort of a, what it's become known in, in Peru, uh, they'll, they'll call them Cotadedos, which is uh, the local way of, of saying shaman just becomes sort of the, the common language. They sit in the center or the one side of the circle and everybody else sits around them. Uh, mm -hmm. After you drink, the ayahuasca, which is a very thick, almost tea that has a pretty acrid taste. Uh, so you drink that, you sit down, you have your intentions of what you're trying to get out of this. And uh, the shaman will then sing uh, throughout the ceremony. And it generally lasts about four or five hours. So after about 30 minutes, that's when the, the psychedelic aspects start kicking in. You start feeling it, see the, often, it, it's different for everybody else, you know, or for everybody. Everybody reacts to it differently. Some people don't have any sort of hallucinations. Some people don't really feel it at all. Some people have full-blown, go into a different planet. Uh, but typically, you start seeing shapes, geometric patterns, colors. Uh, there is a purging aspect, like you said, where for the most part, the majority of people puke it out, and it's almost interplays with getting out what, what, ever trauma you're trying to do and, and sort of the traditional view of it uh, and generally at that time is when it goes full blown um, so it can still be geometric patterns it can be hallucinations of seeing parts of your life uh, other aspects um, it can be all sorts of different things uh, the, the reason why we found it helpful there's many layers that, of why it can be helpful for veterans and other people in general on a, on a psychological level on a therapy level so on the first side, through the hallucinations and through that process, there's almost this pro prolonged exposure therapy side to it, where people who had traumatic instances in the past or are just struggling with life can view it from almost a different angle. So either zoom out from their own life or go back to the scene and let it play out. Um, so a lot of people with trauma just have this sort of replaying story, replaying story, and they can't move past it. For, for many, this process helps them move past it finally and you know filter it away to where they they don't always have to um focus on it so i mean that's one of the the main powerful aspects that i've seen on one level and we can go into the other levels uh too if, if you're interested yeah i mean so i definitely want to get into that what what i could say is because i did ayahuasca is like the the non-concentrated i did the, the dmt which is like a concentrated I guess you could call it like a rocket ship blast right. off kind of thing. And uh, I did it with a group out in Los Angeles and uh, like it was really intense um, from, from my experience. So like you, you, you smoke it and then you're, you close your eyes and you literally like, like that you're in another dimension and then had beings come out, like uh, identify who I was, they were like communicating to me on like the, this other mental level, not really with words or anything like that. And um, like the first thing they were like, is like, why are you here? You're not supposed to be here yet. And all these things. And like, um, then they took me through like past lives, all this stuff. 
And then they were like, get the hell out of here. Uh, don't come back again until you're ready. And then they were like, but for now, go play. And my dog was in the room. And so uh, my dog appeared to me in my vision and we started like talking, right? And so meanwhile, like 15 people are gathered around me and they're watching as I'm like curled up in the field position and me and my dog are like growling back and forth at each other in real life. And then like we did this whole thing where we were, we were yeah, it was, it was pretty insane. So like what I got from that experience was like um, in looking at my life was like, don't be so ready to rush toward everything right i yeah. try to learn lessons try to do things the, the, the right way and um it was it was an interesting experience um with what you guys are doing with this obviously there's a lot of interpretation that has to occur in order for the veteran to get what they came for right so so how does that work with what you guys do and with uh with what you've done yeah, I mean, and, and that's, that can be one of the barriers to entry of this is that a lot of people hear similar sort of stories of, of all this kind of crazy stuff that happens and they're turned off of like, that. oh, I don't, why do I need to go do that in the middle of the woods? Um, and that is really where the interpretation comes in. You, you can view it almost like a dream sort of state, just uh, very intense. Um, and so it's not like you, you view every aspect of your dream literally, right? you're going to be in school naked or you're going to like talk to your dog or whatever crazy dreams you're having. It's not all literal, but generally even with your dreams, uh, there'll be themes. So if you are through the week being very anxious, very nervous, and you're, you're, you're just waiting to fail, oftentimes your dreams will reflect that anxiety in some sort of weird story tell fashion. Right. And so if you're having these very anxious dreams, it's probably reflecting some sort of internal thing that you're not dealing with. And so ayahuasca or psychedelics can work on a similar sort of process. And the value of an ayahuasca experience uh, with this sort of thing over DMT, you know, everything has its benefits and pluses and minuses, is that DMT, like you said, tends to be very quick, uh, 10 to 15 minutes and just this rocket ship. Whereas ayahuasca is not as intense uh, through the process, it just lasts longer. So it's almost like you're in this uh, DMT world, but you have the ability to, you're not drinking out of the fire hose, so to speak. So you have the ability to right. kind of like take it in and internalize it and, and guide you. And so some can be pretty straightforward. Sometimes, you know, people with childhood traumas will go back and they'll see some of these things, but be there in their adult presence, which gives them power. Um, sometimes they'll see their own life and realize, oh, hey, I've been kind of an asshole, or maybe I should do this differently in my relationships, or I keep doing the same sort of pattern. So it's almost like allowing you a different camera lens around different aspects of your life. Um, and, you know, there are going to be crazy stuff. There might be aliens, there might be past lives. And it's not for me to tell anybody what is real or what it means. Mm -hmm. But generally, especially with a veteran audience, we tend to go to the more conservative, uh, straightforward sort of approach. And it's on them to interpret it. We just help facilitate them and give them some tools. So the first part of that is just really, it's called like intention. So before you go, we really work with them, helping them pinpoint, uh, reflect inwards of what are the things you're trying to accomplish? Why are you coming with us? Why do you really want to do this? Um, you know, either regain control of their lives or get over some sort of trauma or be the full version of themselves that they're not currently feeling like they are. And so those are the things they focus on. And the more you internally look, the better you get at it. So then when you go into these experiences, um, it's still that sort of focus, even though it's distorted with all this sort of stuff, but then it, it, it can be an interpretation, like what you had, of these weird Hollywood movies with a theme at the end of like, oh, hey, maybe I should just calm down. Maybe I need to look at things differently and it might take an alien for you to realize that or it might take you know a talking dog and it's on you and that's the the beauty of this over other psych uh, other therapeutic practices is it's your brain talking to you in a way that you'll understand maybe in a little bit of a metaphorical sense but at the end of the day you are the one who's equipped to interpret what your brain's trying to tell you and then it's a practice the more 
you are in tune, the more you realize of like, these are emotions building up in me. These are things I've been compartmentalizing. These are aspects I really need to work on. Mm-hmm. Have, uh, how many veterans have you taken through? Uh, in terms of financially supporting, at this point, uh, about 40. Uh, mm-hmm. In terms of just facilitating, in terms of like helping out and connecting and, and some sort of coaching, uh, a couple dozen more. How, the, how have the results been? Uh, so we, a couple months ago, did an internal sort of survey, nothing scientific, pretty quick. And uh, I think we reached out to 30 people. Um, and we didn't, out of the people that responded, which was the vast, vast majority, uh, every single person responded that their life is better as a result of uh, the the experience. The specific indicators vary to person to person, right? So some people, it really helped their anxiety. Some people, not so much. Uh, some people, it really helped suicidal ideation. Others didn't have that. Uh, so the, the spectrum and the degree varies from person. Some people, it's a life-altering, completely transformational experience. They're still who they are, but they have a whole new grasp on life. Other people, it just gives them that, that initial push that they might have needed or gives them that extra thing to all right, well, I can do this and I know what the next steps are. So the, the, the degree varies, but every single person, fortunately, um, and I'm always skeptical of a hundred percent result just, mm-hmm. but you know, it's good to see you when that, when that happens. And, and for you personally, like what did, what did you get out of it? Have you done it more than once? Have you done additional journeys? Um, and, and if you did, why did you take the additional ones? Yeah, so I've done it, um, I've gone back a few times, uh, sometimes for my own sake, sometimes just the nature of what I'm doing. Uh, So on the latter, the nature of what I'm doing, because we're running this foundation, either I or somebody else in our organization is always sure that we have experienced a ceremony at the spots that we send people to, right? We want to make sure that they're doing it right, and we, we agree with all the practices, like another sort of safety precaution or um, confidence aspect. Uh, In terms of me personally, the first time I went, I got a lot out of it, uh, but I also didn't have the parameters which we're now trying to establish. And so it was kind of me going in and trying to figure it out on my own and Mm -hmm. not having these these tools that I've picked up about interpretation, which I think would have helped me. But also, you know, um, mental health is a life, is a lifetime uh, work in progress. And so oftentimes there's many different layers and in one bout or one ask or one time that you go, you're going to get a lot out of it. And that's enough for you to digest for, we say six months to, uh, you know, at the very minimum uh, six months, hopefully a year, you are trying to incorporate that in your life and try to unpack it. Uh, yeah. But sometimes you discover other issues. Sometimes you discover deeper, you know, just sort of the vein goes deeper. Uh, the, w- the way we kind of preach it is that you should always treat each ceremony as your last. Uh, but it's okay if you go back and it's okay if you're exploring more or even if, if you're using it in a, in a responsible way. But if you're going into a ceremony and you're trying to address issues that you were trying to address the last time, then, then you're, u- you're not using it correctly. You know, you should always be like, all right, well, I'm doing this. I want to get over not over this but i want to have a better understanding to where i can handle this in my own life without a substance Um, and that's a huge part because we live in a society where we're dependent upon medications on pain relievers on whatever we use to take the next steps forward what we're trying to teach is that and what this process allows is self-empowerment um, you can get to a lot of these states and the self-awareness without psychedelics. Psychedelics just happen to be a very powerful pusher or instructor in a lot of ways. But the end goal is that you can resolve these issues or connect to what is bothering you without it. Um, right. And so that's the end process of all this. And that's really what we try to instill on people. Right, right. I've heard before, you know, and I'm, I meditate regularly. I've gotten a lot out of that. I've gotten a lot out of my own um, types of practices and things like that. And, um, you know, I look at those as, as things that, that help along on the journey as far as um, making my mind more aware of 
what it's doing, right? Observing myself a little bit more. Um, with from the marketing aspect of this, right? We're talking about the veteran community here. A lot of these guys have been raised to think like psychedelics are are some hippie substance that that you know can can really mess with you and all these types of things. How are you dealing with getting that message across and how do you communicate with the veterans that might be interested in this type of thing? Or, or is it a self-selecting process where those who'd be open to it are, more, are, are, are the people who are more likely going to be go? It's a combination. It's, there's definitely a self-selecting. You know, it's not our job to, nor do I want to say like, oh, you should do this. I'm, I'm, a, not, I'm a firm believer that this is not for everybody. And right. as, I, as I said before, we're really just providing the protocol and so there is that, that outreach sort of side because those that might want to do it or it might work in their life at where they are, we want to make sure that they know the proper steps to do it and that we're there and we can support them or that we can set them up to do it on their own, correct? Right? Um, and so that side is what we found is it really helps just having the other veteran testimonial at the end of the day, veterans trust veterans. And so if you see one of your buddies, uh, not only preaching about this, but also the actual changes in their life, that's the most powerful thing of like some of the veterans I've sent everybody, you know, it doesn't really matter what they say, but they will notice the difference in this person. And then people will be like, what, what happened to you? Like, I want whatever you're on kind of thing. Um, and so that's really how we're trying, you know, we're not trying to recruit people. We're not trying to do anything like that, but we are trying to share these stories. So if people are in similar boats and they have similar sort of struggles, they'll hear about it and then have that concept of, okay, well, maybe this is an option for me. Let me look into it. And then we can provide them the necessary resource, uh, resources. How about for marketing on the other end? Because you are a, a nonprofit. How, how are you getting donations in and uh, how are you getting that message out? Uh, I mean, it's, it's tough. Uh, it's just, it's a lot of outreach, uh, individual calls, podcasts like this obviously are helpful. Um, we, we often try to have um, reporters, like in, in a couple of weeks, we're going to have a reporter come with us on, on a retreat as long as the other veterans are fine with it and you know just just broadcast it out in, in whatever responsible way possible obviously social media uh but just in a more generic sense the same thing that has worked with veterans tends to work with a large portion of the population uh the people that you know it, it tends to divide by uh political lines in a lot of ways conservative people tend to be less keen on psychedelics versus more progressive people for whatever you know for whatever reasons but both sides agree and both sides generally support the military and are generally pretty vocal about that and so by presenting these people this group that they respect uh and that they support and showing them these these tremendous changes these things where these veterans have tried all sorts of other mental health have been on medication, have had horrible stories, and this is the first thing that's allowed them to reclaim their lives, that's hard to ignore. And so a lot of people we've reached, it's through these testimonials, it's through that commonality of, okay, well, you might still be afraid of these or you might have your stigmas, but let's, uh, let's at least uh, look into this. Let's at least allow research. And that's really the bridge we're trying to cross. So what is that easy first step that all sides can make? And I think that is looking into it and researching it and seeing why these things work. And so that's another side of, of how we're trying to hit this uh, by doing small studies and, and uh, presenting it to people in as straightforward a way as possible. You know, not over promising, not bringing in other viewpoint or not bringing in too much of other outside stuff, allowing it, but just talking straightforward as possible about what we're trying to do and the, the success stories that we've had. It's interesting because I think politically I'm seeing more of a change out there these days, whereas like there's more conservatives out there these days who are in favor of allowing these types of things and trying these types of things. And I'm seeing, I, I don't want to call it like resistance from the left, but I, I'm seeing more people maybe on the left-hand side who are, are putting up roadblocks to different things like Kratom and, and, uh, um, 
medical marijuana and things like that. Uh, it just seems like that kind of stuff is changing. We're coming into kind of a new time and place where people are seeing these things in a little bit different of a fashion. You know, like I'm, I'm a political conservative, but uh, very libertarian in my views as far as what people should should be doing or, or able to do with their bo their bodies, their own bodies, especially if they're not hurting somebody else, you know? Yeah, and I found that the same with a lot of military and uh, Marines and special ops guys, is a lot of them tend to be kind of more of like, hey, if it helps you, if you're telling me it helps you, why, who am I to have you just, or tell you to stop doing that? Like, right. if you if this is saving your life, then go for it. And, and I have a few friends that you can talk to as well. Whereas people who are disconnected, uh, who tend to be like politicians, then they're going at it through either philosophical upbringing, monetary, whatever, yeah. you know, it's, it's really yeah. like, if you're in the trenches, it's different rules. than if, if uh, you yeah. have the ability to look over it, but yeah, I mean, it is kind of weird. Uh, the, 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 the big news was Biden was going against marijuana. And fortunately he got called yeah. out from it because that's a ridiculous, ridiculous. notion to have in two, 2019. It's so uh, stupid. It's so freaking stupid. Um, you know, and, and uh, it, it just boggles my mind that somebody at his level doesn't have better people advising him on, on, you know, these types of issues or educating him on these types of issues. And it's just like, these people go back to their sound bites and, and their crap. And it's, it's ridiculous, you know? Yeah. And uh, I don't know. It's, uh, marijuana is just a very interesting aspect, especially as a country that's already, had a failed experiment in prohibition and a repeated failed experiment with the drug war. And, you know, there are aspects of marijuana that definitely need to be, you need to be cautious about and there needs to be more understanding about, you know, that's, that's for sure. Um, and it's not just like everybody should be high all the time, but to deny that there is some sort of benefit to deny that uh, a lot, thousands of veterans are using it as opposed to dangerous medications. It's just, that's ridiculous yeah. for anybody to not understand that. Yeah. And not only that, putting up like ridiculous roadblocks, like, like, um, barring people from getting conditional use or not conditional use permit, concealed carry permits for their, uh, for their weapons and things like that, I think is ridiculous as well. I mean, like, because essentially there, there's people out there, I mean, me and myself included, the second amendment is very important to me. And there's a lot of people who are going to be driven away from medication that could potentially help them simply because you want to use it as a political chip to, uh, to make a point, you know, and that, that yeah. bothers, bothers me a lot. Um, let's bring this over to, to some of the, um, you know, the, the community out there, right? So um, you have MAPS, which is an organization that's doing a lot of experimentation in, in these areas. Have you worked with any of those organizations as well? Do you partner with them, that kind of stuff? Yeah, we, we, have, a, we have an open communication um, in terms of direct partnerships, a couple of, of smaller ones. It's just kind of finding the, it's still an emerging field. So there's plenty of spots for people to kind of find their own niche. Uh, all, and that's kind of the interesting thing about this community uh, because it, it, it really started uh, in sort of this open source mentality. And it's only emboldened by the fact that we're dealing with plants for the most part, right? Like mental health coming from either marijuana or psychedelics like grow in the ground, you know, the, the whole movement is against anybody commercializing it to a ridiculous right. level. Like obviously you have to make a buck at the end of the day, but it's, you know, the last thing people want is a, like a Pfizer economic model of of what you see with like opioids and all sorts of other stuff and what they're trying are to do. Are you like depressed? Ketamine. Are you lonely? Try you. Yeah, Wasco. Exactly. <laughs> like, yeah, only, only a hundred thousand dollars for three treatments. Yeah. Exactly. Uh, and so, yeah, I mean, that's kind of the interesting thing. And, and so, you know, we're all, we're all aware of each other's space. MAPS is extremely focused. The majority of the research, you know, they're, they're a general psychedelics uh, research uh, uh, nonprofit but their mm -hmm. big focus uh, for the past few years has been uh, MDMA for using, p uh, for treating PTSD. And they've had some pretty amazing results. The FDA declared it breakthrough therapy. Um, they've been having results between 70 to 80% complete recidivism of PTSD like symptoms and the, the test subjects. Uh, and it's probably about a year maybe a couple, maybe two years away from being a legal treatment once again 
uh, for treating PTSD and then uh, potentially depression. So, I mean, they're, they're almost, uh, what, what I tell a lot of people, they're almost like the standing army, the occupying force. Like they've just cleared so much ground and they're there, they're like the hub and they're doing it by the, the traditional way uh, through the FDA, through painstaking trials that cost tens of millions of dollars, all of which was uh, crowdfunded. Not even a single government cent went to supporting the biggest breakthrough in PTSD research, which is a travesty in itself. Uh, and then it's allowing organizations like mine to find different aspects of like, hey, ayahuasca has these benefits that I believe are can either supplement that or are a new avenue to explore. Yeah, that's a cool process, though. I mean, to, to crowdfund something like that. Yeah, I mean, you're literally you're getting the will of the people, right? And, um, <clears throat> you know, I think uh, one of the things about that is, is that they gives you so much freedom to, right. to be able to explore this stuff and to, to really make it happen. And, and if you're able to build a movement like that, um, you, you, can, you can do some really amazing things, you know? Yeah, I mean, it's just tough, though, because of the reg uh, because of the regulations, it also artificially prevents it. So, I mean, it is a beautiful thing that people are finally coming together uh, with this kind of stuff. But if you look at something like the history of research into marijuana, uh, it has been pretty stymied because of that. So mm -hmm. the reason why there's not more understanding and research and that hasn't progressed anything is because it's nearly impossible by governmental standards. One, there hasn't really been funding. Now there's more funding, obviously, because you have like billion dollar cannabis companies. But two, in order to actually study it, the government owns the only uh, legal growing operation that you can get the marijuana from for studies. And the quality is, is garbage. It's, you can't right. use it for studies. Uh, and so it's just this weird catch 22 that, you know, the same with like MDMA. It was legal as a therapeutic uh, substance back in the 80s. And then during the whole, you know, restricting drugs sort of uh, flow that happened, it's been illegal up until now. So what's that like almost 30 years of something that we know has benefit that's been artificially restricted. And so that's kind of the tragedy around it. I was like, I agree with you of like all the, the benefits and it's a beautiful thing that's all coming together, but it's also pretty sad that it's taken this long to provide effective treatments for people, you know, especially the veteran community. It's how many people have needlessly suffered and, and died as a result of just a lack of good mental health options. Yeah. I mean, a lack of good mental health options and, and people, I mean, it's really the government coming in and saying, you can't use this. You can't do this. You can't do that. Right. I mean, like I'm dealing with an ulcerative colitis flare up right now. And the VA has got me on 40 milligrams of prednisone a day, which makes me feel like I'm out of my mind. Right. And, yeah. and the only thing that kind of takes the edge off is uh, a combination of Kratom, CBD and, and uh, THC. And so uh, if I didn't have that right now, I'd be a basket case. I wouldn't be able to sit through that, th through this interview. Um, right. And it's, uh, you know, it's crazy. It's crazy. I don't like that there's a segment of our society that likes to control what other people do with their bodies. I think that's, that's, it's stupid. It's horrible. Right. Yeah. Um, and yeah. uh if you want to get you know, high, then go like uh, at the end of the day, it's like, if you're not hurting somebody, then why, why is it your business? Why is it somebody right. else's business? And, and why put somebody in a cage for it? It's, it's so stupid. Right. Um, yeah. And with, CBD, CBD is like the perfect example of like, it doesn't even get you high and it has tremendous benefits. And you know, that's for, I think it was the Navy, but I think it's across the board. They just said, no, you can't, you can't use that. Yeah. Yeah. It's uh, it's pretty crazy. It's pretty crazy. But now, I mean, I'm seeing CBD everywhere. They got, they got CBD and I saw it in, in Rite Aid the other day. I was like, holy shit. You know, it's, yeah, it's probably not great quality, but you know, it's the next Starbucks. It's, it's crazy. Uh, I, I get reached out just in the, the, the field we're in CBD is the most prominent. There's just so many companies cause there's a ton of money into it. Like I said, there's, there's the first few billion dollar companies in, in Canada, uh, in the cannabis market. 
Yeah, I get I get reached out um, to every week from people who are who want to come on and talk about it. Um, with so with what you're doing right now, so what's the next step for your organization? What 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 types of objectives are you trying to reach? Uh, do you have any objectives for 2020 that you're trying to get to? Yeah, it's it's always just expand on what we're doing. We really spent the last two years uh, working on our model, making sure that the program that we offer people is doing the best that we possibly can, given the, the limitations that we can. Um, and so especially the big part is is the tail end, and that part can always be improved, which is called the integration phase. We kind of touched on it is after you come through these ceremonies, you have a lot of information, you have a lot of insights. How do you use it? How do you implement it in your life? How do you set yourself up for success? Create rules, create routine, that you do go back to the gym, that you do improve your relationship or that you don't go back to the bar. Um, and that really takes a community, that really takes a better support network than, um, than we can necessarily provide in as extensive way as possible. So always trying to improve that. Uh, we're doing some, uh, we, just, we just partnered with a couple of universities. We're doing our own first uh, study. So we wanna expand those uh, to show actual, like why this is working on a, blood, on a blood basis or an inflammation basis to give just more information support behind what we're doing. As always, uh, increase who we are sending out uh, you know, more, get more veterans out there, uh, do it a little bit more consistently. Um, one of the, the two big things that we're trying to implement next year is one, the amb an ambassador program. So, you know, we get a lot of people that want to help. They just, we just don't necessarily have the means for them to help. You know, it's, it's, if it's a very unspecific, like, Hey, I just want to help I have time. Then it's, it's hard for me to, to, to work with that person. So we're trying to form this community sort of network that other vet yeah. nonprofits tend to have, you know, maybe link them up with a vet. Like, Hey, if you wanted to go to one of these retreats, but you're financially a little bit limited. Okay. Well, I'll link you up with this person in your same community. You guys can work together. We'll support you do like a GoFundMe go to a local CBD shop, maybe they'll sponsor you, you know, figure out these sort of options. Um, yeah, I, so I, I, I want to mention that because I think there's a lot of people who reach out and they're like, hey, I, I want to help your organization in any way possible. And, and I get there's a lot of people who want to help that kind of stuff. But you really, if you're going to reach out to an organization like this, like you should have an idea of how you're going to help. Right. You should have an idea of what you can add and things like that. And that just help because then then a guy like Jesse, he's got to sit there and figure out how to fit you into this complex puzzle that he's trying to navigate. And, and that's, that's going to eat into his time, you know? Yeah. I mean, for, for any organization, not just ours, like if you yeah. want to reach out and help, the best way to do it is like, Hey, I'm Jesse. These are my skills. This mm -hmm. is, I see you do this. This is how I think I could help or potentially could add on to it. That just really helps because I don't know you. I don't know what you're good at, what you could potentially help out. And if it's, you know, and that's what we're trying to change too with the ambassador program. In the past, it was very hard. If somebody didn't have a specific skill to add, then oftentimes it can take more time to incorporate them into a nonprofit. And so that's why we're trying to develop this, this infrastructure uh, to allow even the, everybody uh, to just donate some time here and there and, and help out a veteran in their community. Um, yeah, and then the other project that I'm pretty excited about is we are – trying to work with some uh, pro athletes, former pro athletes who are also having their own mental health uh, battles with their organizations that aren't uh, addressing CTE, traumatic brain injury sort of stuff, depression, suicide, similar kind of things. But they're also very interested in going these sort of routes. And so we're, we're looking to sort of combine the two efforts, uh, bring uh, like NHL players and veterans to a retreat uh, with sort of this, this mutual support sort of network, possibly the athletes, uh, can help support the vets that are a little bit financially, un uh, unable, and then they heal together, share the sort of warrior bond kind of thing. Uh, so that's, that's a program I'm pretty excited about that we're, we're looking to test and then expand, uh, in 2020. That sounds amazing, man. Um, let me ask you this because, 
uh, you know, running a nonprofit is, is something that I think a lot of people try to do. Um, but a nonprofit is just like a business, right? You, 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 it is a business, you know, essentially your background was in banking, right? Um, mm-hmm. and was it I banking, something like that, or was it? Yeah. I worked at a small boutique investment bank. So we did a lot of like capital raising. Nice. And so, so that, did that help you along the way? And, and, uh, was there anything, what did you have to learn to be able to do what you're doing now? I still made a lot of mistakes like anybody, but it, it gave me at least some baseline on the financial side, just keeping good records, keeping track of all that. Generally speaking, since we're doing capital raising, we got a lot of proposals at our door. And so you could really see good ideas versus good businesses. You know, everybody has a good idea, but what makes you special and what have you implemented to make it an actual functioning business that will make money? Because, you know, the majority of businesses fail and it's the same with nonprofits. So it's always, it's always a struggle, especially on the nonprofit side, especially dealing with a fringe illegal substance uh, right. because we don't have the options that a lot of other nonprofits that might be able to get grants or government funding, that's just not available to us. And then uh, more conservative companies also tend to shy away, uh, obviously, because of the, the PR around it. So that's, that's been its own sort of challenge. Uh, but, you know, it, at the end of the day, it's adapt and overcome. It's, I think the, the combination banker military mindset uh, has helped me tremendously because it just forces you to be creative. You know, you're, you're, you yeah. go through all this training of like, hey, you're going to be in situations where you don't have, you know, air support, you don't have maybe your weapon breaks or, you don't, or something happens. Like, how are you still going to complete the mission or how are you at least going to get home? And, you know, it takes creativity, it takes grit and determination. And so that's kind of how we're trying to push this. And that's, you know, that the, the athlete uh, retreat is one of those aspects of like, okay, well, donations can be pretty unreliable. Um, and, you know, they're not always as much as we want. So what's a different way we can approach this economic model that can continue to help us send bets, send other people, but also give something that people will demand. That's how that, that, that is what it's all about, man, getting that mission done and, and making sure that you're hitting those objectives, no matter what you've got in your way. Um, how can veterans apply to this program? Where can, where do you hang out on social media? Where, where can people learn more about you? Yeah, of course, uh, we're on all the, the major ones, uh, Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, Instagrams are our, our, our main go-to one right now. Uh, it's all Heroic Hearts Project, either at or search it in Facebook. Um, and so that we do generally just a lot of posts, uh, not just ayahuasca, um, other interesting aspects, research about different psychedelics and what's going on. Um, so it's a good information resource and stories of vets that we've helped. Uh, our website is heroicheartsproject.org. You can also mm-hmm. Google search it. Uh, within there is a lot more research and there's some testimonials of vets we sent. There is a veteran section where there we have our application. So if, if it is a veteran that is interested, uh, they can go there, fill out our application. Um, and they can also email us, ask us questions if they just have some sort of doubts, concerns, and we'll do our best to, to get back to people. Uh, mind everybody if they are you know we are a small nonprofit and unfortunately the demand the situation is is severe enough where the demand is pretty overwhelming in terms of vets that are seeking us as as a as 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 an option which is great that we can be there but you know uh we are limited in our ability each year to how many people we can send. So all I ask is just be patient. You know, you might be on, there's a pretty long waiting list, but there are opportunities, uh, sometimes last minute opportunities. And so somebody who is down the line on a wait list can get bumped up for a variety of reasons. But if, if you're interested, uh, that's where to reach us. That's where to ask questions and that's where to put your name on the list. Um, for those that are interested in, in donating, uh, you know, there's a donation there, uh, button on the top right corner. We have a Patreon, we have a, you know, Facebook donation, any way you want to get us money, we'll take it. Uh, and then how are you, also- how are you using Patreon? Are you, uh, doing like a membership thing? Is there like a, uh, what do, you, what do they get in return for being patrons? 
Yeah, we just we need to expand that. Uh, I just put it up as an option. It's not really that robust right now. It's it's kind of more of for those people that just want to make they can make monthly small donations. That's the benefit of it. You know, if they just yeah. want to donate two dollars here, hopefully, you know, especially you know potential ways with this athlete tour retreat where we can actually give them content or if they're bigger donors down the line, have them join us on a retreat or something along those lines. It's all a work in progress. Outstanding. Outstanding. Well, Jesse, uh, number one, I want to thank you for coming on. Um, sorry, we, we had some scheduling difficulties earlier on. So I, I apologize for that, but uh, I'm glad you came on here and enlightened us about the work that your organization is doing. Um, and, you know, I want to just acknowledge you for, for, kind of walking the line there. You know, this is a, a subject that's probably taboo for a lot of people. And, um, you know, even though it is taboo in the grand scheme of human development, it, it, it wasn't, right? It's really just been taboo for the last like 20, 30, 40 years, right? So, right. Um, you know, this is something that, that organizations like yours are allowing us to access again and uh, slowly bringing it back for the good of humanity, for the good of our minds, and the, for, for the good of the veteran community. So I appreciate you doing this. And thank you for your service. Uh, mutual. Thank you. Um, and thank you for providing me with the platform to, to share it. You know, it's a we, the self-supporting veteran community, right? Like we need each other to, to push forward. And I appreciate you having me on and, and uh, you know, helping us spread this message further. 100% man. Um, to everybody out there, uh, definitely go over and check out Heroic Hearts. Um, and, you know, like I say every week, guys, uh, life is short, right? We don't get to be here forever. Um, think about how you're living this life. Uh, try to bring some clarity to your own situation and, and really kind of observe yourself. Are, are you showing up like you should? And if you aren't, why? All right. Ask yourself those questions because, you know, like I said, we, we don't have much time and you got to live your best life while you can. So get out there and do that. We'll be back at you next week with another awesome interview. Talk to you guys soon.